So tonight, welcome, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I have a little bit of business and some announcements. Bob uh, Buchheim and a uh, short presentation, as does Tom Palakis. And our featured speaker is Dr. Nick Moskowitz, who's going to be talking about the DART mission, which should be lots of fun. Just for introductions, I'm Claude Haynes, the president. Woody Sims is over there waving his hand. Uh, James Yoder is our secretary who just ran away. Uh, Treasurer Brooke Schofield, who will be here shortly. He sent me an email. He had forgotten something and is going to come back. So if you have shirts to buy when Brooke gets here, uh, just go quietly deal with that. Uh, the other would be if you want our new memberships or if you have um, uh, anything else to do with Brooks, and I'm blanking. Uh, board, Don Wrigley is working in the observatory tonight. Tom Mosden down front playing with technology. Steve Bradshaw is in the back. Uh, Alex Beck is in Tucson. It's his daughter's birthday. And then Dave Kosho right up front. And then James Yoder is also our property director. Um, Marty Pazanka is our webmaster. He's also working the observatory tonight with Don. Events coordinator, we need a volunteer. Uh, if we go another month or two without, we will draw names out of a hat. Uh, don't delay renewing your membership. Uh, Brooks will be glad to help you with that. Uh, and also he has badges. I think we're down to 47. Uh, that's what he was going to get. So if you have ordered badges, please pick up your stinking badges. Uh, Preco, we're open for public viewing Friday and Saturday evening. Sunset to 930, weather permitting. As all of you are aware of, this has been a rough season. I just went to California uh, for a few days, and um, it isn't an issue of cups running over. Uh, it is just flooding and just awful things. So uh, this is a flood season to be followed by locusts and boils and rivers running with blood. Not sure what other plagues with, are there. They already have check marks for earthquakes. And we all know astronomy is the gateway drug to science. And I would encourage you to come out for our public star parties. They are a lot of fun. If you haven't done that, I really would recommend it. We have a loyal cadre of folks who have shown up uh, pretty regularly for these, but we, it would be nice if we could expand it a little bit. It isn't something that you have to know a great deal about. These are short people. First thing is do not touch the eyepiece. That is what you will say more than anything else. And the second one would be, this is the Orion Nebula. This is Venus. This is Sirius. It's about eight and a half light years away. How old are you? Four. Okay, the twinkle in your eye tonight left before you were a twinkle. So you just have to know a little bit to explain to kids or parents, and it's a lot of fun. We have various uh, sessions coming up. Uh, Ironwood Crossing is on Monday, and Viewpoint Community Association. Uh, Michael Cupper, are you here? He is an EVAC member, and he lives there and is kind of organized this for his community association. I'm going to be doing solar viewing at the Arizona Science Center. They also have public viewing on Friday night at the Science Center. It's a wonderful place to view really bright objects because other than that, you won't see anything. Okay, Don't plan on doing very many of the Messier objects. Um, Fountain Hills Dark Sky is on Saturday. They're having something from like 4 until 9 p.m. or so, and uh, we have a note on that coming up. Uh, then we have Gold Canyon. We have already filled that. There were three of us. This is a test that we're doing with the uh, Gold Canyon Dark Sky Initiative out at Peralta Park. And then Ap Apache Junction Government Center, I'm going to be doing a short lecture, and then we'll do some viewing after that. Now, Bob, let's see if I stop sharing. I'm not going to stop sharing. I'm going to try this, and when it fails, okay, Bob, uh, not Bob, uh, Ted, I'm asleep. There we go. This is Ted Blank. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you again, after all of us being stuck in the house for two years. Uh, 
we, uh, Fountain Hills is, is the 17th International Dark Sky Community. And every year we hold our Dark Sky Festival, which is gonna happen next Saturday, the 25th. Uh, it includes uh, wine, beer, live music, uh, a, uh, a Einstein Exploration Center tent where kids are gonna learn about the physics of light. And from dusk until nine o'clock, a star party. And I'd like to invite anybody here who'd like to participate in the star party to bring a telescope and uh, join us. Uh, I can, if you want to, just send me an email, tedblank at gmail.com. Um, we also have food trucks there and we will offer you a $20, an envelope with a $20 bill in it so that you can take a break and go get some food at the, uh, at the food trucks or uh, wine or beer or whatever you like. So hope to see some of you there. If you'd like to come, you can see me here at the break or send me an email. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Now. Now do you see my slide? Okay. All right. So the Messier ma Marathon, which was to take place tomorrow night, has been canceled due to clouds. Um, the weather forecast has improved slightly. So if you go out, maybe you'll get three or four hours of viewing and then by midnight, it'll be cloudy for the next four days. Uh, so we are thinking about possibly moving it to next Saturday, uh, but we don't know, uh, or moving it to a, f a future time. Uh, we're just trying to figure that one out and we wanna make sure that it's a good night where you have some good viewing. Um, we are gonna be using our new location, which is available to use on a monthly basis. So our BLM uh, contract with them has two major events and uh, we listed people going out individually to uh, view. So it's on North Hovata Road, uh, it does not require your vehicle to be a mountain goat to get through the washes. It's a flat drive. Um, I can't speak for its condition after the rains uh, because it is a county road, but um, it is uh, a nice level field and hopefully you have good access to the skies. And sadly, uh, the airport is gone. They are putting up big transmission lines. So uh, that is that is proceeding apace. I think the solar uh, array thing is uh, is kind of done, but we'll see. And now for Bob Bukan. Thank you, thank you, Claude. How many of you were here last month? Okay, we saw a really interesting talk by uh, by Dr. Jansen, and in which he told us a whole lot of things, but there were two things that really struck a chord with me. The first was the whole point of his project was to provide time series rather than individual snapshots, multi-wavelength of objects from these space-based telescopes. And the other was, those of you who are here, remember I asked him the question, what's the, the brightest star that Webb can make a measurement on? And his answer was magnitude 19. Now that's an important number because the, the faintest star that we all can see is somewhere in the magnitude 13 to 15 range, right? So there's this gap, this no man's land between the brightest that that big telescope can do and the faintest that we can observe. And that might make you wonder whether your observations can contribute to science because those big telescopes can't see the things that you and I see. And the answer to that question, can our observations contribute to science, depend on the part of the universe that you're looking at. And the trick is divide the universe along three axes. Uh, going in and out of the page, some things are bright, some things are faint. Going up and down, some things are invariant. They're the same every time you look at them. And other things are dynamic. They change as you watch them. And for those things that change, what's the time scale of the variation? Is it centuries or decades or hours or minutes? It turns out the big professional telescopes, they live in a world of faint objects 
That's what they're designed to deal with. And they live in a world of time allocation committees. You present your proposal, maybe you get permission to use the telescope. And in that environment, time series is really, really hard to get uh, allocated to you. So their sweet spot is making a very small number of very precise observations of an individual object and not coming back to it very frequently. That's their world. We, on the other hand, live at the bright end of that brightness axis. And it turns out, out there, there are an enormous number of dynamic phenomena. You know, double stars go around each other, maybe in a decade, maybe in 100 years, maybe longer. Uh, there are transient events. There's nova and supernova and cataclysmic variables that you need to watch over time in order to see the action. Uh, asteroids rotate. There is a whole menagerie of stellar variability that happens on time scales from, again, decades to minutes. That's our world where we can contribute. Um, the time series part of that is driven because all these things are dynamic phenomenon. We can sit on that object all night making, say, a series of observations to watch it change. You can't go get the Palomar telescope and say, I want to sit on this object all night to watch it change. Um, we have electronic imagers now. That changes our role from just looking to measuring. We can take data in addition to just see these objects. If, if an object needs continuous observation, there's a worldwide network of people like us. Uh, if if you, there's an object that needs to be covered all the time, well, it's, what, two-thirds of the time, it's daytime here. We're in Arizona, we've got a night. If you've got a friend in Maryland and another friend in England, and another in Poland or Italy, and another in India, and another in Japan, and one in Hawaii, you're like the British Empire. The sun never rises on your target. And you can get 24-hour continuous observation of it. And there's more of us than there are the professionals. And so that kind of observation is something they cannot do. So the answer to the question is absolutely yes. Amateur astronomers can make real contributions to real scientific research by looking at that part of the universe that's our niche. And if you're curious about what that research is and you'd like to learn how you can participate in it, where you want to be is the Society for Astronomical Sciences upcoming symposium, uh, June 22, 23, and 24, um, in person in Ontario, California, or will be fully interactive online. So you can see the talks, ask questions, interact with the speakers. Uh, registration is open now. The website is on that screen. Uh, some of you are already involved in this kind of research and you're a little late at getting your abstracts in to present a paper. Abstracts are due on March 30th or earlier. Come join us. Come to Ontario, join us online, meet the gang, and see what people are doing in their backyards in the dark. Thank you for your kind attention. All right, and then Tom Palakis um, with a presentation. All right, so that works. Okay, let me get nice and close to the microphone here. So uh, the last three months of last year, I spent uh, 49 nights up at Lowell Observatory and um, did observations for the main speaker here, Nick Moskowitz, for the DART program. So I'm not gonna talk too much about DART, but more what I was able to do kind of recreationally while I was up there. Uh, here are my nights that I observed at, uh, for DART are indicated in yellow. It was four different observing runs and I'd come back to the valley for those places in white. Uh, you can see that Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas are among those, so they couldn't find anybody else who would actually want to do that. And so I got to operate the 42 inch telescope. Um, look at this chart uh, made with Sky Safari 
and it shows some of the problems with the observing of the asteroid of Didymos and its companion Dimorphos. The impact, I think I have that wrong, it's September 26th. Uh, I don't know why it says 28th. And then my observing runs are shown in red. So if you know the sky at all, you know that that area way below Orion and Lepus is down at declination of about negative 30 degrees and it rose at about one in the morning. So that first bit, that first couple weeks after the impact, it was way down in the muck, but we did get observations, useful observations. And the second run had its challenges that it's passing right through the Milky Way. So it's passing through a lot of 15th, 16th magnitude stars. And when the asteroid does that, that's corrupting the data. And then the last two, which are kind of as it goes into its retrograde um, or out of its retrograde loop, uh, those are really the sweet spot that worked out great. So just to give you a background on where the observatories are located for Lowell, Mars Hill, just to the west of Flagstaff, which most of us have been to. Uh, nine miles southeast of Mars Hill is Anderson Mesa. That's where the 42 inch Hall telescope is that I observed with, that I operated. And then quite a ways farther down the road, south of Mormon Lake is the flagship, the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. So a little inset view just to show how far away they are. So I'm gonna page down. So it's only nine miles by air from Flagstaff, which I think has 70,000 people now. But because the lighting ordinance is so good in Flagstaff, the sky over Anderson Mesa is less than a half a magnitude above the natural level, as dark as it gets on the planet. So it's actually a very good observing site. Uh, the sky glow from Phoenix to the south, 110 miles away is worse than the glow from Flagstaff nine miles away. It's broader anyway. So we had a lot of that in early October, a lot of roiling clouds, and we'd get shut down even by a humidity limit rather than clouds, which was frustrating on a couple nights, but that, that only got better as we got out of the monsoon conditions. If you like cloud watching as much as I do, you would watch this 100 times in succession. But, uh, so show you a few other things. At, at Mars Hill is the Geovale, Geovale Open Deck Observatory, Godo. And where I stayed in this Lifer building upstairs in the Tombaugh Lodge is about halfway between the uh, Clark Telescope, the 24 inch, the famous telescope, and um, this observatory, which is relatively new and just show you a few shots of it. That is a 32 inch reflector in the foreground, which is a very nice mirror, uh, kind of way off in the background is a five inch refractor. And then there's kind of a conversation piece, acromat re refractor that's beautiful to look at more than it is to look through, but it, it does its job. Uh, Mead and then two plane waves, which are out of view here. A little time lapses of this happening. So anywhere I go, I have to do time lapse imaging. So if you get a chance to get up there, it's, it's a nice, uh, nice setup with a lot of real good telescopes. Um, I did get the privilege of observing and imaging Mars uh, through the historic 24 inch Clark refractor. And when I've gone up there four or five other times, I've looked through that telescope, the seeing has been really bad, atrocious. And so the seeing was kind of respectable. I think I, uh, have an image of that here, this kind of sample of what the seeing looks like through the, through the um, refractor. It has a focal length of about 10 meters, so you don't use a barlow or anything. You just, you just go directly. Prime focus is more than enough, and even then your image scale, that's about the image scale I like to use for my driveway with my 15 inches, about a tenth of an arc second per pixel for planetary imaging. Um, so it's not a real good Mars image, but it's exciting to me because I got to take it through the great 24 inch telescope. Um, that's what I was able to come up with. You can see some clouds up on the Northern limb and then Sirtis Major was near the Meridian and some other features. Here's Anderson Mesa. The, the good news about this type of observing for me was that you can get on the asteroid and get everything set up and then you just have to check as kind of the focus shifts and there are other things that happen with this 1970 model telescope that you kind of have to pay attention every half hour or so. But I could go and run around the grounds and, and Anderson Mesa is just a terrific place to kind of wander around a big ponderosa pine forest, real quiet with dark skies. 
So I went and uh, took photographs, some from inside the dome. Here's a time lapse of the 42 inch tall telescope that I was using. It just kind of goes the, uh, the dome cranking along as it tracks. That's when Didymus was pretty far to the north, as you can see. Uh, zodiacal light. So the good direction, the best direction from Anderson Mesa is, is east. So north, northwest is Flagstaff, then of course south is Phoenix. Even due west, you have a little bit from the Verde Valley, that kind of thing. But the east is almost pristine, so you have a really beautiful view of the zodiacal light and the rising Milky Way. So that same photograph as a series in, in star trails. I really like this one. This was taken with a wide lens with a 17 millimeter and the distortion on the lens kind of makes Polaris and the trails around it to an oval. But you can kind of see where the celestial equator is, is where you have the straight star trails and then they bow south, they bow downward and upward as you go south and north of it. Another shot of the 42 inch and in the audience tonight is Mike Wiles. This is his uh, 20 inch uh, telescope. So uh, I did a lot of measurements of seeing conditions before this gig, like in early uh, 2022 at this site and at the telescope at the 42 inch, maybe the seeing something we're used to here, like two and a half arc seconds, it's not that great. But a lot of the reason for that is that you have this big, heat capacitance of the building, which is mucking with the seeing, and the dome we now know is not really the optimal design for seeing. So what's happening is it's getting deteriorated between the outside air and inside the dome. Uh, actually, the seeing outside, the median seeing that I measured was 1.1 arc seconds, which is really good. I mean, it's, that'd be a night where you'd wanna look at planets. And we had about four hours of that before the wind shifted to the east and messed it up. And Mike and I did some nice visual observing through his 20 inch scope, which is really sharp. Uh, got to be winter eventually. The good news about this site compared to Flagstaff and anything below it is that at night, it's about 15 degrees warmer than it is at along Lake Mary Road. So you, you only drop 400 feet and you watch that temperature on your car thermometer just plummet at dawn. And so it only gets down to like the teens uh, on the very coldest nights at Anderson Mesa, which I can go out and do that and then jump back into the heat at any time in the control room. I messed around with a accessory called a, a lens ball. I think there's other manufacturers, just a, a nice crystal sphere, three inches in diameter. And what you do is you focus on the ball itself. So it's kind of like macro photography and you deliberately defocus the background with poor depth of field. So I messed around with that. In the background, it's the only photo I have in this presentation of it is the 72 inch uh, Perkins telescope, which is even older than the 1970 uh, 42 inch. I think it's from the 1930s, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's extremely old um, and still operating it's now owned and operated by Boston University, but it was open on most of these nights as well. So it, it keeps getting used and it's productive. Another lens ball shot, I really like this one. So you wanna use as the mounting surface for a lens ball. I tried all of the mounting hardware and I found at Stella Artois beer was, was the best. So, um, and so just a star trail photo. Um, you can see at the top of the lens ball, this I couldn't figure out right at first, that there's star trails on the horizon, and those trails are coming from behind me, reflecting into the lens ball and coming back to the camera. So that was kind of new. But the, the star colors are terrific through these things, which, so I, I like defocused stars a lot more, as long as it's not when I'm trying to do science imaging. So I became really fascinated with air glow so this is a perfectly clear sky. This is a sky where you would look up and say, you know, there's no clouds and there's no clouds in the satellite images at all. And this was happening a lot on these nights that you have air glow, which is 50 to 100 miles overhead. And they are, uh, they, I'll get this wrong, but it's, it's this, it's happened during the day that it's, that it's been excited by the solar radiation and then it releases at night. So you get these kind of standing waves. So there's one of them. In this case, I laid the camera flat on the part of the dome that's right before the split. 
is below the slit because I kind of like this perspective. But again, you'll see the air glow moving into the scene. And so there's a lot of stuff written about what's the right color of the night sky by people who do pretty pictures. And what is it? Because it changes from kind of the gray to green during this series. And there's these orange bands that go through. So it's, it's pretty interesting that when the sun is getting toward this maximum, we're, we're getting a lot of this. Um, I actually would have a shift change. Brian Skiff uses this telescope. He's one of the only people who really uses the telescope regularly. And he would want to go to bed at 11 at night or so. So he would, he'd, he'd uh, observe till 11. I'd show up right about then. We'd have like a half an hour of overlap and chat. But for a while, the asteroid wasn't favorably placed until one in the morning. So I'd have an hour and a half where I could just do pretty picture stuff. So this is just a sampling of some of my favorite galaxies that go barred spirals, grand design, and flocculent, all the way to uh, down in the lower right are a couple of uh, local group galaxies, Wolf, Lundmark, Malat, and IC 1613, a uh, peculiar galaxy pair, NGC 520 over there. Um, so it's kind of fun to, to observe this with 42 inch telescope, better than I can do in my backyard even. Uh, one of the nights of, of observing, what was that night again in November, uh, Nick told me not to observe Dynamis and let's get on this object. This is really was exciting. It was discovered by David Rankin at the Catalina Sky Survey in Tucson an hour and a half before I took this image or two hours before I took this image and an hour and a half after I took this image, this object uh, struck in Lake Ontario, in Western Lake Ontario near, near the land in Ohio. Um, near Earth object that was immediately mobilized and got coordinates. And I tried and tried with the 42 inch because the ephemeris was changing and the rates are changing. Everything is, is crazy how, how fast it was going. And eventually got one decent image that shows these stars trailing in the background and, and this near earth asteroid, which is pretty cool. Um, and then just a couple other shots. It has nothing to do with Anderson Mesa. But if you ever see a situation where a Falcon 9 launch is going to happen during our twilight, no other time. It's not interesting to observe one of these an hour and a half after sunset or morning, any, any other time of night. But during twilight, the lighting is, is from the back when they take off from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And you get this. And it was just spectacular. This was uh, with Brent Arkinall outside of the US Geological Survey uh, office where he works. You can see the uh, first stage separating from it at this part, and then it kind of falls back, gets brighter toward the end. Really cool. Um, so definitely want to pay attention to these rocket launches. Finally, um, so Nick has a 3D printer. So as a gift to me um, for doing all the observing, which is a lot of observing got done at Lowell, Lowell Observatory, which he'll tell you about. He gave me a 3D printed models of Didymus and Dimorphos. I think it was at 5,000 to one. Yeah, so it's 5,000 to one scale. And where I'm holding them is about the right distance between the two. So just imagine that orbiting like that, which was really cool. Um, so I'm really looking forward to Nick's talk because this DART mission is one of the coolest things we've done in the solar system. Thanks. All right, I forgot one slide and I wanted to mention it. Uh, the Grand Canyon Star Party is in June uh, the 17th through the 24th. Um, it is uh, managed by the Tucson Club. So if you go search for the Grand Canyon Star Party, their uh, website is now accepting reservations. And I would go and reserve lodging if you're going to inside the canyon. Uh, I was able to find one, uh, but a room, but there were only three or four left at that particular location. So the tourists are back at Grand Canyon, June 17th through 24th. Uh, if you want to go to the North Rim, I think Steve Dotter is still managing that or not. Tom is shaking his head. Okay. Is it on the SAC site? Okay. I'm going to give this over to Woody. I want to introduce our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Nick Moskowitz. Uh, Nick's an astronomer at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. 
He has a PhD, uh, bachelor's degree in physics. He got it at the University of California in Santa Barbara and a PhD in astronomy from the University of Hawaii. Um, did you dual major? In surfing maybe and? Scuba diving. Scuba diving, okay, all right. I saw something that looked suspicious here. Uh, his research is related to small bodies in the solar system with active projects involving video observations of meteors, curation of an asteroid database, which you can find at uh, asteroid.lowell.edu, should be pretty easy to remember, asteroid.lowell.edu, and observations of near-Earth asteroids, which, is this a near-Earth asteroid? Okay, good. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Woody. Uh, Tom, thanks for the, the overview of all the stuff that you did up at uh, Flagstaff the past year. Uh, it's been great having your help with this project. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight to hear about uh, this very uh, exciting uh, uh, project that we've been involved with for uh, about six months now since the, we impacted an asteroid, intentionally impacted an asteroid for the first time. Um, so I'm an astronomer at Lowell Observatory. I work on planetary science topics. Um, I'm very interested in things near to the Earth, like meteors and asteroids and near-Earth asteroids. Um, and he is holding the microphone. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, OK, all right, <laughs> keep going. Um, so I'm a, an investigator on the NASA's DART mission. Um, this is the world's first planetary defense test experiment. So the first experiment to see what we could do to defend planet Earth if we're ever in the unfortunate situation of discovering an asteroid that's on an impacting trajectory. And so this is sort of our first steps in that direction. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the project. I'll give an overview of some of the things we did to set up the project and give a sense of where things stand now, because this is very much an active mission. We are still doing work today. <laughs> uh, we were on LDT this week. I'll show some of the images we collected at the Lowell Discovery Telescope this week. Things are changing very quickly. And so this is sort of the, the state of the mission as it stands today. If I were to come back in a couple of weeks, it would probably be a different talk because we're learning new things almost every day as we analyze the data that are coming in. Uh, so I suspect folks here are at least familiar or have heard about DART. Uh, this is just a brief overview of some of the, the sort of climactic uh, conclusion to the, the spacecraft part of the mission. Uh, this is a summary video showing the approach phase of the DART impactor. Uh, approaching uh, the asteroid Dimorphos. This is an inset on the video here of the control room at uh, APL, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And they're getting very excited because that happened. Uh, the, the spacecraft stopped transmitting uh, during the last image. And that was what we were hoping for. Uh, so <laughs> the NASA infographic here showing that impact happened. Um, this was a big event. It was uh, one of the most watched events in NASA history uh, in terms of social media watching, people watching the actual live stream. And for anybody, how many people actually watched the broadcast when it was happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew it was gonna be exciting, but I didn't know it was gonna be that exciting. It was just really good TV. It was very captivating to watch this thing. And it was very tense because we didn't know what was gonna happen. And as I said, we're still learning about the outcomes of this project, uh, which has been just a ton of fun to be involved with. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try to address uh, three questions in the talk tonight. I'll talk about why did we do DART in the first place. So this is sort of the background motivation for why we even bother smashing a spacecraft into an asteroid in the first place. Um, I'll talk about what we did to set up the experiment, and that's largely sort of ground-based observations, providing the data that's fed directly to the mission planners so that they could success successfully hit the asteroid, and uh, then allow us to continue observing the, the sort of aftermath of this experiment. And I'll finish by talking about what we're finding out. I, I should not have let, phrased it that way because we're still finding things out. We haven't found out everything there is to find out so far. Um, and that's, again, uh, you know, part of the fun of a, a project like this. Uh, so I think uh, my, uh, my daughter's online watching. Hi, Kyla. This is a drawing she put up on my whiteboard a couple weeks ago uh, in my office. And so I took a picture of this and figured this was a perfect slide to set the stage for the solar system. So we have 
Uh, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, of course, is in the, the list of planets. Um, and then lots of little dots that represent the minor planets in the solar system. These are the asteroids and the comets around the solar system. Um, so the majority of the asteroids that we know about in the solar system, we now know of about 1.3 million asteroids in the solar system. They live between Mars and Jupiter. That's the main belt of asteroids. Uh, some of those objects through various processes can leak out of the main belt and enter into the sort of domain of the terrestrial planets and into the regions between Mars, Earth, Venus, and even down to Mercury. Those are what we would refer to as near Earth asteroids. And those are the objects that we're focusing on tonight because this is sort of a planetary defense talk. We're talking about objects that can hit the Earth and pose a potential hazard to the Earth if they were to impact us. Uh, this is a little bit of an outdated movie, but the, the concept is, is, is spot on. So this is sort of a year in the life of the Earth. So we have the Earth at the center here, sort of a geocentric view here. And all of these dots whizzing around are known asteroids. And I say this is outdated because this video is the state of the near-Earth asteroid population in 2008. And things have changed dramatically since then. We now know of over 30,000 near-Earth asteroids, whereas back then we probably knew of 10,000-ish or so. So we know of three times more objects. So imagine three times more dots whizzing around in this space of the Earth. And as you can see, some of, the, some of these objects get very close to the Earth and do pose an impact hazard. And we know that objects hit the Earth. We have record of this for, through various, uh, various means. Uh, this is a, a data set of fireballs recorded by US government sensors. And so these are downward looking satellites that the Department of Defense operates uh, looking for blasts in the atmosphere. And occasionally they will release publicly some of the events that these satellites have recorded. We don't know much about the instrumentation that's involved in recording these events but they do send us data and say, here's an event, it happened at this time, at this place, and it was of this energy level. And so that's what these dots here represent, are all of the fireballs or the large impacts that have happened over the Earth from 1988 through 2023, February 19 was the last data release for this, fire, this US government sensor data. And we see an energy scale here associated with the energy released with each of these particles. Those numbers don't mean a whole lot to me. And so I had to look up what those, those numbers mean and attach a scale to them. Um, if you were to take my dog Pepper and throw her at the atmosphere at 30,000 miles per hour, she'd release a few hundredths or maybe a tenth of a kiloton of energy. So this is the size impactor we're talking about, sort of medium dog sized impactor is this energy scale here. If we go up one level more to sort of uh, you know, a few kilotons of energy, that's sort of a hippo. So again, throw a hippo at the planet at 30,000 miles per hour, it's going to release a few kilotons of energy. And if we go up one more, uh, this is the dome of the Clark Telescope up at Lowell Observatory, sort of, you know, ten, tens of feet high type of uh, structure. That's going to release hundreds of kilotons of energy when it impacts at typical impactor uh, speeds at the atmosphere. We don't have too many of these scale impactors. There is one that stands out right up there. This was uh, uh, an important event in, in astronomy and in the, the sort of kickstarting a lot of the effort uh, related to the field of planetary defense and uh, really, I think, uh, kind of created some of the momentum that allowed the DART mission to happen. That impact was the Chelyabinsk impactor over Russia, uh, February 15th, 2013. This is a dash cam video of a, a guy on his way to work that morning. Uh, well, maybe he was already at work. I don't know. This is 9.30 in the morning on February 15th. And this spectacular fireball came in through the atmosphere. Um, this guy just keeps driving towards it. He never really swerves or anything. He just keeps on going, which is kind of amazing. But this is a spectacularly bright event. Um, it broke up. It fragmented in the atmosphere. Pieces rained down on the surface. The largest of the pieces made a crater in a lake. Divers went down to the bottom of that lake at the end of February and picked up the biggest piece, which when they put it down actually broke apart. So it's no longer the biggest piece, but uh, several pieces. Um, so this event we didn't see coming. The asteroid was coming from the sun side, sunward direction. So we couldn't detect it with our telescopes beforehand. Um, and so no warning was issued, unfortunately. And what ended up happening is this big fireball came in, flash of light, uh, went off at 9.30 in the morning and people rushed over to their windows to go see what was that that just happened. And that's when the shock wave hit. 
and the shockwave blasted out windows, knocked down garage doors, knocked over walls in some cases, knocked over roofs. And that's what all the injuries associated with this event were. They're mostly glass shard injuries or you know, contusions from getting hit by flying material. So if we'd known about this asteroid ahead of time, we could have issued warnings and say, don't go look out your window at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll avoid a hospital visit. So about 1,300 people, I think, ended up in the hospital following this event. So these things happen. They happen infrequently, but we're getting to the point where we can start detecting them and, again, provide warning, ground warning, to people in populated areas if need be uh, to, to prevent injuries uh, in, in, in the unlikely uh, case that something like this happens over a heavily populated area. So I want to talk a little bit about how often things hit the Earth. This is frequency on the y-axis and impactor size on the x-axis, where we have very large objects over on the right and very small objects on the left. We have very rare events on the bottom and very frequent events on the top. And so this is, answers the question, how often do we get hit? How often does the Earth get hit by stuff from outer space? That's your answer. Very simple linear relationship in this log log plot. Big stuff hits us infrequently, small stuff hits us all the time. And that's good because if we were getting hit by 100 kilometer bodies every year, we wouldn't be here. Right? These are mass extinction type of events. I'm going to lay some examples down here just to put the, some of these in context. So here we have our you know, dinosaur ending mass extinction event creating the Chicxulub impactor, probably a tens of kilometer size impactor. And again, fortunately, these things only happen every 100 million years or so. These are not very common events. Uh, moving up, uh, many people here have probably been to Beringer or Meteor Crater um, outside of, uh, east of Flagstaff or outside of Winslow. Um, this was something like a 50-ish, you know, 50 to 100 meter size body that came in and created this spectacular crater. Uh, there's debate about how often these types of impactors come in. Maybe it's every few centuries, maybe every few millennia, but it's in that sort of, you know, a bit longer than human time scale, but probably long enough that we should be worrying about it. Like we should try to do something about it next time we find one coming in. Oops. I don't know why I did that. Another related object was uh, the Tunguska blast over Russia. This was a, an air blast, an object that came in, came in, exploded over Russia in 1908, I believe. Um, no meteorites were recovered, no crater was created. It was purely an air blast, but the air blast was so strong that it leveled hundreds of square miles of trees in the Siberian forest. And if you Google or look at the Wikipedia page for Tunguska, there's amazing firsthand anecdotes about people that were in that area. It's not a very heavily populated area, but the people there talk about their clothes feeling like they were on fire when the, the heat wave from this blast hit them. And um, that again is sort of, you know, maybe a tens of meter sized body that could happen every few centuries kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, Chelyabinsk is a bit smaller on this sort of 10 to 20 meter sized object. And we think those happen every few, few decades um, kind of thing, maybe every 50 years, maybe every 100 years or so. So this is definitely getting to the point where, okay, we should do something about objects of that size if we find them before impacting. And then down at the small end, these are the small things that come in that create spectacular fireball meteors that don't ever reach the ground but are interesting for other reasons, and that's a topic for a different talk. Um, so getting back to DART, DART really fits in this middle size regime here where it's not impactors that are large and very infrequent. And it's not impactors that are small and happening all the time. It's the ones that we really need to do something about if they were found on an impacting trajectory. And so that's what DART is trying to address, this sort of intermediate size range where on decadal or century timescales, we know that impactors are coming in at that frequency, and it would be good to do something about them if we find one that's coming in. Okay, so let's talk about DART. So DART is a pretty simple experiment. It is kind of like a rock hammer in space kind of experiment. Let's smash two things together and see what happens. So DART targeted uh, a binary asteroid system, Didymos, the primary, and actually impacted the secondary, Dimorphos, there. And the spacecraft impacted at about 13,000 miles per hour. And the goal was to impact the asteroid and to see what happened, see how we could actually deflect the asteroid in its orbit around the primary 
uh, with this kinetic impactor technique and to see how much deflection we could actually impart uh, onto, onto that satellite. This is sort of the one side summary of DART. I'm not going to go over all of this in detail, and probably some of the text is too small for everybody in the room to be able to read. Um, DART's top level requirements. So this is what NASA told us we had to do on the DART mission. These were the top level requirements. We first had to impact Dimorphos, the satellite. If we had not impacted, not much would have happened after that. We had to change Dimorphos' orbital period around Didymos. We had to measure that change. And we had to use that period change to calculate a quantity known as beta. I'm going to spend the next two slides talking about beta. So hold off on just a second there. I should, you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. I should have said this up top. If you have questions, throw up your hand and ask them. Um, I, I, don't want to, I don't need to plow through this without any interrupting. So feel free to interrupt if you need to. Um, so these are the top level requirements for the mission. The, the basic parameters of the mission are we launched uh, on Thanksgiving Eve in 2021. And just over 300 days later, the DART spacecraft impacted Dimorphos. Dimorphos is a 160 meter sized asteroid. So again, that sort of sweet spot of impactor size, where again, they're not so large and infrequent that we don't have to worry about them, and they're not so small that they're not going to do damage. So that's one of the main drivers for why we selected this particular system to impact it. Um, obviously, the DART spacecraft didn't survive this impact. It hit at 13, 14,000 miles per hour. Um, so we relied on Earth-based telescopic observations to witness the aftermath, to see what happened. And then there was also a CubeSat that the Italian Space Agency contributed that was released a few weeks before the encounter with the asteroid, and the CubeSat flew by collecting data of the impact event. And I'll show some of the imagery and, and uh, data from that uh, flyby. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about beta. So beta is this parameter that we refer to in uh, uh, impact experiments. And beta is really a way to quantify how much extra momentum is imparted during an impact due to the release of ejecta. We know the mass of the spacecraft, we know the velocity of the spacecraft, and we know essentially the vector at which it's hitting the asteroid. That's easy to work out how much momentum the spacecraft is imparting onto the asteroid. What we don't know is how much extra momentum you gain from all this ejecta getting kicked off the backside. So this is an experiment, this is a lab experiment of a, a granite sphere being hit by an aluminum bullet, essentially. The bullet's coming in from the left side, hitting the sphere, and what you see is this uh, impressive amount of ejecta coming out the other direction. And because that ejecta is escaping off to the left, it's pushing the sphere to the right, and that's the momentum enhancement. That's the beta factor that we're trying to figure out with this experiment. Before DART, we had no idea what beta would be. It could range from 1 to 10, which is a big range even for an astronomer. And uh, that has dramatic inf impact, on oh, impact, no pun intended, on what the orbital deflection you can achieve uh, with this particular system or uh, mission architecture. So here's sort of a graphical representation of that beta factor. We'll show three examples of Beta equal to one, which means you have no ejecta. You're just imparting the momentum of the spacecraft in your impact. Beta of two, where you have sort of the same amount of ejecta as you do the uh, spacecraft mass. And then beta of four, where you have a lot of ejecta. And the basic idea is with beta one, you get a little bit of deflection of the asteroid in its orbit. With beta two, you get, oops, sorry about that. When beta is equal to two, you get a little bit of ejecta there which contributes a little bit of an extra momentum to the asteroid and kicks it a little bit further in its orbit. And then if beta is equal to four, you get a lot of ejecta and the asteroid really gets deflected really far in its orbit. So that's what we're trying to determine because if we need to do something like DART for real, we need to know what the beta factor is. We need to know how much ejecta is gonna come off of these objects and continue to push them in their orbit more than just the mass of the spacecraft by itself. <clears throat> Okay, so before we impact, before we actually impacted, we had, we spent years, um, almost 20 years studying this system. So we would know the initial conditions before the spacecraft ever arrived. We can't just do the impact and look at the aftermath. We need to understand what the initial conditions are to really be able to measure and quantify in a very precise way what uh, influence the spacecraft impact had on the system. 
So there was a lot of work involved in that. And one of the key uh, measurements that it was, have been made of the Didymo system dating back to uh, its discovery as a binary asteroid uh, back in 2002 is the measurement of uh, uh, eclipses and occultations in this eclipsing uh, binary system. And so this is an artist's ren rendering of the, the Didymos system, Didymos and Dimorphos going around. The system as viewed from the Earth is unresolved. So we would not actually be seeing this through the telescope, obviously. We would just be seeing this as a point of light, but we can measure that, the brightness of this system with our ground-based telescopes and look at how the brightness changes over time. And as this object uh, undergoes these eclipses and occultations, when Didymos passes in front of Dimorphos and Dimorphos passes in front of Didymos, we see dips in brightness. And those dips in brightness allow us to essentially use uh, uh, those dips as a chronometer for the orbit period of Dimorphos around Didymos. So that's how we're able to measure very precisely how long it takes Dimorphos to go around Didymos. And we spent years refining this number so that we would know exactly what the orbit period of Dimorphos was before we went ahead and changed it. One of the main contributors to this uh, effort was the Lowell Discovery Telescope. This is a picture of it. Again, as Tom said earlier, it's about an hour south of Flagstaff. This is Lowell's flagship uh, 4.3 meter facility. Uh, we used this telescope from about 2015 onwards, up in the, I'm still using it today, up through the mission to collect these light curves uh, of uh, Didymos and Dimorphos to measure that orbital period and refine it so that going into the, the impact, we would know what the initial state was. Um, here's an example of one of the data sets uh, pre-impact. So this is from July 7th of last year, uh, sort of the start of the current apparition. So in July, Didymos started coming up. Uh, we were able to start observing, leading into impact, and we're still observing it now with the current appar appar apparition kind of closing out over the next month or so. Um, and here we see Didymos trucking through the field of view, um, through the center of the field of view. And so we spent many nights on the LDT. Um, that's one of the benefits of sort of owning your own telescope is we can get as many nights as we need to do this type of science. And so we've sat and stared at Didymos a lot of nights on that telescope and have gotten a lot of data. And so we've gotten light curve after light curve after light curve after light curve. And this is just a small subset of some of the data that we've collected, again, going back to 2015. And in each one of those light curves, we're looking for those mutual events, looking for those eclipses and occultations to time the period of dimorphos around Didymos. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, so uh, Mike asked uh, which instrument this came from. This is an instrument known as LMI, uh, which is the Large Monolithic Imager. Uh, it's a 6K E2 VCCD. It's the primary imager um, on, on the Discovery Telescope. It was the first light instrument on the telescope and still is sort of the primary workhorse instrument at the facility. <clears throat> So after 20 years of observations, Didymos was discovered as a binary system in 2003. There was a long period where it wasn't really observable. And then in 20, starting in 2015, um, every chance since then, we've been observing Didymos with the Lowell Discovery Telescope to collect more light curves and refine that orbit period. And this is the answer that we had going into impact. Uh, we knew the orbit period to a precision of 65 milliseconds. This is by far the best characterized binary asteroid in the solar system, by far. Not, it's not even close. Uh, we knew the position of Dimorphos at the time of impact, so where Dimorphos would be in its orbit, to about 10 degrees in mean anomaly in its orbit. The engineers told us they needed a number better than 45 degrees. So we delivered on that by a factor of four. And that's, again, largely because of this long baseline of observations spanning so many years that we were able to pin down that position that allowed the spacecraft to essentially hit a bullseye. So then on uh, September 26th, DART came in. We knew the orbit going in. Dimorphos, after DART hit it, is on a new orbit. And that is what we've been working on so hard for the past six months, is to figure out what happened after DART hit. And so what I'm going to talk about for this sort of second half of the talk here is uh, sort of time sequence of events following impact, what data have been collected and what we've been learning along the way 
and kind of highlighting some of the particular some of the ground based observations that we've been collecting to, to characterize the system in the, the aftermath of the impact. So I'll start when things started getting interesting, like really interesting. This is four hours before impact. This is when the spacecraft went into auto nav. So the, the impact speed uh, was so fast that we could not joystick the thing in. It had to be auto nav, entirely auto, auto navigation. And so the auto nav turned on four hours out. So at that point, the engineers took their hands off and prayed, I guess, <laughs> you know, it's like, at this point, everything is autonomous. There are no more corrections being made. And this is what the spacecraft saw. That fuzzy dot in the middle is Didymos. We don't even see Dimorphos yet. Dimorphos is coming out from behind the limb of Didymos so that we hit it head on. That was the idea is to maximize the sort of relative velocity between the two. You wanna wait for Dimorphos to come and hit you square on. Um, so four hours out, that is what uh, the Draco imager on the DART spacecraft saw, and that's when AutoNav got clicked on. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, so the question was, did we hit, did we hit the Dimorphos head on or from behind? And we hit it head on with the satellite moving towards the satellite, the satellite moving towards the spacecraft so that the relative velocity between the two was maximized. Yeah. There was another reason for that. Uh, the orbit period before we hit was 11.9 hours. So if we'd increased the orbit period, it could have been a nightmare for ground-based alias issues. If you'd hit, you know, if you'd increased the period to 12 hours, it would have been a nightmare for ground-based observers. It would have been a lot harder. So we thought, okay, we don't wanna increase the period, let's decrease it. So to decrease it, we hit it so that they're moving relative to, you know, towards one another. Yeah. Another question in the back. Um, you know, things happen pretty quick. As I said, so this is all we, so we, we don't even see Dimorphos here. So we know nothing about Dimorphos at this point. It, Dimorphos, the, our best analog for the shape of Dimorphos before any of this happened was essentially like an M&M. &M. Like that was our shape model, right? Sort of this oblate spheroid that, you know, has no shape or structure, nothing, nothing known about a rubble pile or anything like that. So it wasn't until we actually got close enough to be able to see it that we went, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that's gonna do. Um, but it, we never got to the point where it was like, uh oh, there's a hole or something, or we're gonna miss it. It was, as you'll see, and you probably saw, we were dead on the whole way. We hit within about, uh, I don't remember the exact number, meter, meters, maybe tens of meters of the center of figure of the bottom. So it, it, was, it was a bullseye. <laughs> um, yeah, so four hours out, auto nav turns on. So hands off, spacecraft's doing its own thing. Uh, this is now 73 minutes before impact. And for those like me who are close to the screen and probably nobody else, there's a fuzzy dot right here. That is the first detection of Dimorphos. The auto nav system is still targeting at Didymos. It's not even seen Dimorphos yet. It can't distinguish those two quite yet. And it wasn't until 50 minutes that Dimorphos got bright enough and was coming out from behind the limb of Didymos that, okay, auto nav picked that up. And now it knows where it's supposed to be going, but that's a complicated algorithm to run, right? As you've got two things <laughs> that, you're, you're, that are in your field, in addition to hot pixels and background sources, and you have to fly towards that one, the fainter of the two. And then here are the last five minutes as watched in that video at the beginning in Mission Control. This is what they were watching. This is, a, again, letting AutoNav do its thing. You're seeing course corrections there as the spacecraft is thrusting to keep Didymos in the center. These are just two different stretches of the same image. And here you can see, this is sped up, this is not real time. Um, but this is, you know, when this was happening, this was everybody's first view of Dimorphos. So was, as we're coming in, we're like, wow, that is a rubble pile. That is a, <laughs> there's a lot of rocks there. And as you can see, we came in dead center on the center of figure, which is, made complicated by the fact, it made even more complicated by the fact that the viewing geometry is such that it's, it's a relatively high solar phase angle. So you're not necessarily looking for the center of brightness because that would push you off towards the limb, but instead you're trying to hit the center of the figure, which has to account for these phase angle effects. So the auto nav system, which was made, sort of the main technological demonstration associated with this mission, 
had to solve all of that in real time by itself and did stunningly well. And it was this last image that got all of us very excited. We had a big watch party up at Lowell and we got really excited. Here's my daughter and this last image where download of that image stopped <laughs> before it could complete. And that before anything else, that told us, yes, we hit. I mean, we kind of knew we were hitting when we were seeing those last images. It's like, there's no way we can miss now. But this was pretty exciting, is seeing that red image. Uh, there was a poll going, or like a, a bet in the mission, what row in the image would be the last to read out. I don't, we still haven't heard who won that poll. But uh, anyways, we didn't get very much of that last image. Um, but that was terribly exciting to, to see that last uh, partial image download. <laughs> I'm having a great time. This is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious what the frame rate was or, uh, that uh, they were taking those images at. So. I don't remember that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I don't remember what the frame rate was. It was pretty fast. It, comms was not an issue for this, this mission because it was so close. And we essentially, so if you recall, around that time, Artemis was looking at doing its test launch. And if Artemis had launched at their first window, which would have been right around this time, they would have eaten up all of the deep space network and we would have, would have had a more difficult time in transmitting continuously. But because Artemis got pushed by a bit, we were able to essentially use the entire deep space network for continuous transmission. And so the, the data rate was insane. It was like I don't know, a Hertz or something like that. You know, it was like an image a second, something like that. It was, it was pretty fast. All right, so as I said, this is very much an active mission and there's a lot of stuff going on and almost every bullet point here could be a talk by itself. And so I, there's just no way I can go into all of this. Uh, papers are just coming out now. We just had our first five papers appear in the journal Nature um, last week or the week before. So those are online. You can check those out. We're working on lots of different things because there's data, is a, a flood of data, which is a great situation to be in, and we're working our way through it. There's the imagery from the spacecraft. There's the imagery from this CubeSat that I mentioned earlier. There's different types of ejecta, and I'll show some examples of that. There's something that we didn't necessarily expect or had not thought through. There's something that we're referring to as the fast ejecta, which happened on very, it was ejecta that came off the system very soon after impact. There's the light curve of mutual event analysis. I'll talk about that. There's the dynamical evolution of the system. So we stirred up this system. So now we've got dimorphos in an eccentric orbit which plays all kinds of games with how, it, how its orbit evolves over time. We think, we think it's processing now, and we're trying to figure that out and what that means for the long-term stability of the, the binary system. Uh, there's radar imaging campaigns. Uh, there's spectroscopic investigations, understanding the composition before and after. There's slow ejecta evolution. Space telescopes are involved, both Hubble and James Webb. There's shape modeling to figure out not just the shape of the bodies, but the boulders and the boulder size distributions on the surface. There's refinements of this beta factor that I talked about. There's modeling being done of the impact process. So this is you know, dozens and dozens of people around the world working on all these things. And as I say, each one of these is a, a talk topic by itself. So I'm just gonna kind of touch on some of the highlights here, probably skewed towards ground-based observations with the exception of this. So this is, uh, the CubeSat that flew by. This is the Italian CubeSat that flew by. And what we're looking at is just a, a GIF, essentially toggling back and forth, of a few minutes after impact as this CubeSat flies by. And you can see Didymos in the top there, Dried Morphos down here with this spectacular impact structure coming off of the surface. Um, and you really get a sense of the sort of 3D structure of this as this CubeSat is whizzing by at, at these extreme speeds. Mm -hmm. So people are looking into the analysis of this, the evolution of the ejecta as seen from Lisha Cube. Why, for example, Didymos looks so bright, why you're essentially getting glint off its surface. Those are people are looking into that and trying to understand the scattering properties of, that sur of the surface. Um, this is a, an image put together by the folks at ASI, the Italian Space Agency and APL, where it's the ejecta with different stretches applied as you get closer and closer to the central bodies. So the boxes obviously are not real, 
but just different stretches apply to different regions. But you can see how complicated the structure of this ejecta cloud is. This is not just like a nice cone of ejecta coming off the surface. There's an incredible amount of complexity here. There's over densities in here. There's boulders in here that we see that we were tracking that we've seen gotten kicked off the surface and we're able to watch the track of those over time. Um, this looks nothing like any of the models that were generated beforehand <laughs> in terms of the morphology of the ejecta plume. And so this is gonna keep the, the theorists, the people that are running these hydrocode simulations of high impact, high velocity impacts, this is gonna keep those people busy for, for years uh, trying to figure out how you can create in a computer simulation an impact plume that looks like this. As I said, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a telescope user, telescope observer, and so a lot of the stuff I've been focusing on is uh, contributing to analysis and collection of data from ground-based facilities. This is just a list of the telescopes that have been involved in this campaign, and the wonderful thing to see here is that every continent's involved. The Aztec point four meter in Antarctica contributed. We have data from them that's appearing in some of these papers. So every continent's uh, contributed data, and it really is a global effort, which was very much intentional. We think, you know, the mission's take on this is that planetary defense is a global, a topic of global interest. And so the more people we can, you know, engage in this process, the better off the science is and the better off the project is. And so it's wonderful to have so many contributing facilities here, um, including all of those here in Arizona. Nothing from Russia yet. <laughs> All right, so fast ejecta. This is from a one meter telescope in South Africa. South Africa was uh, well positioned to actually see the, the impact. Um, impact happened over, over uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, and so South Africa was well suited uh, to see this. And what we see here is this plume of material escaping really quickly outwards. And if you see the time ticking by in the top, this is a movie that's playing on loop, lasts about 30, 40 minutes, something like that. So this is a very fast eject, uh, escaping ejecta. And this surprised people at first until we realized that when this spacecraft hit, it still had fuel left on board. And so what we're seeing is the explosive escape of fuel, hydrazine and xenon were the primary fuel components on board the spacecraft, explosively escaping from the surface, escaping at very high speeds, like 10 kilometers a second speed. Um, and it's that explosive release uh, following the impact that caused that fuel to probably crystallize, pull some dust off the surface with it, which is what gives it a nice scattering surface so it shows up as bright. Uh, but this is pretty exotic physics here. We, we don't really have good optical constants for hydrazine at 12 kilometers a second with asteroid regolith mixed in. And so people are working out like, what is it that these data are telling us and what, you know, what actually is going on there with this escape of material? How much of the asteroid did it take with it? And this was not something that was modeled beforehand. Like nobody, I guess we thought this would happen, but nobody really expected us to get data good enough to see it. So this was kind of cool to see early on. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, it looks like there's actually two objects emit, emitting stuff to the right. Like there's a, the one at the bottom is, is more diffuse and the one at the top is more of a thin line of material. Okay, so you're talking about this thing? Yeah. So that is uh, just a, a glare. With oh, that's just glare? Telescope, a sc scattered light issue with that star, the okay. bright star. So what we're talking about here is, you know, uh, Didymos is the center of frame and it stays at the center of frame. And then the plume that we're seeing escape is this sort of half shell thing escaping off to the right of the, the video frame. Okay, yeah, the other one's an opti optical artifact. Yeah, right, optical thank artifacts, you. yeah. Exactly. So fast ejecta, we're working on it. Uh, the space telescopes both got in on the action. This was the first simultaneous observations conducted by James Webb and Hubble. Uh, so James Webb had just gone up and was you know, collecting data and this was the first time the two were used in tandem on the same object, so that's pretty cool. Uh, James Webb went, uh, the folks at James Webb really bent over backwards to get these data for us because when uh, James Webb launched, it had a tracking limit, a non-sidereal tracking limit that was slower than Didymos was gonna be moving across the sky. So they said, sorry, we can't do it. And we said, please, and they said, okay, we'll try. And they got us to half the rate of Didymos. And we said, no, that's not good enough. Can you try more? They tried again. They went through tests and they progressively got up to the 100, 
100 milliarc seconds per minute or whatever the tracking, I don't remember the unit, but it was, uh, they got us up to the tracking rate needed to be able to collect these data of, of Didymos. And so that not only was this the first simultaneous observations by Hubble and James Webb, we also pushed the limits of James Webb, which will benefit all future users that want to look at uh, non-sidereal objects in the solar system. These James Webb data are spectacular. This is work in progress, and I can't talk too much about that other than we see really complex evolution of the ejecta with stuff coming off of the surface and maybe boulders and things like that, you know, that we're able to track over time, which is really cool and telling us about how stuff got kicked off the surface. <laughs> Uh, two days post-impact, uh, uh, this is uh, an image taken with the 4.1 meter SOAR telescope by Teddy Coretta, who's a postdoc at Lowell working with me. Um, this spectacular image shows what this thing looks like from the ground, where you have a tail now that's tens of thousands of kilometers long. You have the ejecta cone opening up to the left um, with the dart impact vector shown there. Um, a highly complicated structure that uh, continued to evolve in the days and is continuing to evolve in the days and weeks after impact. This one really caught us by surprise. This is 12 days after impact. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see that there is a northern tail and there is a southern tail. And we have no idea why there are two tails. We only hit once, <laughs> I think. So how do you get a second tail is being actively debated within the team. The one possibility is that some of these boulders that were lofted off the surface hung around in the system for 12 days before they re-impacted onto either Didymos or Dimorphos and kicked off enough material to produce a second tail. But that's kind of speculation. I'm not sure we'll ever know. This is a hard question to answer with the data that we have, but it's fascinating that we would get this sort of double tail structure coming off the body. That was a big surprise. And we really only saw it in a very limited time window, sort of 10 to 15 days after impact. And then it sort of faded away. Uh, with the earlier picture, we saw an, a, a depiction of how much um, Dimorphos' orbit changed. Was there any impact to the orbit of Dimorphos? Uh, did he most, the bigger, bigger one? No. So the, the deflection of Didymos is not measurable at this point. There was a deflection, but it was so small that there's no way we really can measure it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's kind of the, the cool part about this mission is this would never have worked if it was not a binary system because we don't have kinetic impactors big enough to push something the size of Didymos. We had to hit something small. And the best way to hit something small is to look at how its orbit changes around another body, and in this case, around Didymos. So we were able to do this experiment because it was binary and actually be able to measure it. Again, because it's an eclipsing system, that's how we're able to measure. And I'll get to that at the end is what we actually measured for the period change, which is one of the key measurables. Yeah. yeah. That uh, double tail, that couldn't be a cone, could it? People have tried to work out geometry effects, whether you're looking at some kind of, you know, viewing geometry effect, it doesn't seem to work out. This is too fast. 12 days is too fast to get all of a sudden a, a short-lived cone that, you know, you're looking at the edges of. But I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, it's being worked on, but it's, it's one, of the, one of the ideas under consideration for sure. Yeah. When you were talking about objects impacting the Earth, you had your dog size impactor. What was DART? Was it a small dog? <laughs> DART was a, 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 a vending machine. Yeah. <laughs> a big dog, yeah, you're, you're Mastiff. You're, yeah, yeah, a very large dog. Um, yeah, I forget the dry, it, it was hundreds of kilos. It, it, it was on that first slide, but it was a, a very massive dog. Yeah, so, so one of the other aspects of DART, um, there was on board a, um, a next generation ion drive, which was gonna be a tech demo. And it was gonna be used during the cruise phase to increase the velocity at impact. They turned on that, that ion drive and were getting weird thermal feedback into the rest of the spacecraft. 
to the extent that they were uncomfortable jeopardizing, potentially jeopardizing the mission if they left it on. So they turned the ion drive off after an hour or a few hours, whereas, whereas it was supposed to be running for weeks. So what impacted was an ion drive filled with xenon, <laughs> uh, which was something like 80% of the fuel still in the, in the or, or more in the, in the spacecraft. So there was a non-negligible amount of fuel on board that was not initially planned for. Okay, 52 days post-impact. Here we are, November 18th. This is us at the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And again, this spectacular tail, the morphology's changed now. There's no double tail. There's no ejecta cone now. The ejecta cone has blown out. And all we're left with is this tail, but that's telling us that material is still escaping the surface or still escaping the system somehow. Our thought is that over time, uh, first the small particles will get blown out of the system by solar radiation pressure. And then as the smaller particles get cleared out, slightly larger particles and then larger and larger particles. So at some point we should run out of material they can't escape the system anymore. But 52 days after impact, stuff is still coming off of the surface. There's no disconnection of the tail from the primary uh, brightness spot. So stuff is still coming off 52 days after impact. I, I have a brief question. If you oh, don't yeah. Mind. Uh, I'm just curious to what the follow on is. Okay, you've got a lot of data here that you've accumulated, but how does that relate to a follow on for planetary defense? You know, you have some data that you could get an idea of what impactors can do, but is there a plan put in place to evolve larger compactors or impactors depending upon what the size of these objects are? Sure. And who's setting that up? So I am setting that up. The, the talk will end with some of the planetary defense implications of this experiment, how we can leverage these data in the future. Uh, but there are also many other uh, impact mitigation techniques that are you know, discussed and written about and, and modeled. This is the first one we've tried. There are others um, ranging from gravity tractors to solar sails to um, interacting with the body with a drill, throwing material off the surface and using that escape of the material to slowly nudge the body. There's the nuclear option, um, painting them. Yep, so you can paint them and let solar radiation pressure uh, change, change the orbit. Um, none of these have been tested. And so this is sort of the first step. And there are many other techniques we'd like to test. And I would love it if there's a DART 2.0, maybe we hit a different type of object, right? We're just hitting one kind of object here. There are lots of different flavors of asteroids and comets in the solar system. So it might be beneficial to run another version of DART hitting a different type of object. But then there's all these other different techniques that we might want to test as well. And that's sort of, we're kind of in our infancy here in the sort of planetary defense game. And um, it's, it's sort of a long-term game. You get, you know, we're taking baby steps here and learning as we go, and there's always going to be more, more to be done. Um, but it's sort of adding tools to our toolkit on some level, and this is the first, first one that we've added. So here we are. These are data taken three days ago, March 14th, uh, at the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And for those with good eyes, you can still see there's a tail. There's still material coming off of Didymos um, this week. Uh, so we're 169 days post-impact. Uh, there is not a single model run before the impact that said we were still going to be seeing a tail this long after, after the impact event. And we're going to be working on this, again, it's one of those things we're going to be working on for months and years to figure out how this is possible. <clears throat> Oops. Jumped ahead a little far there, sorry. Okay, um, so let me get back to the orbit period change question, right? So we're measuring, again, the orbit. That's my, my primary role in the mission has been to collect and analyze data related to the orbit period of Dimorphos. And so that's sort of the part that I'm most connected to, and it's the part that Tom contributed most to the data collection part of this project. So again, we're using the binary aspect of the system to measure the orbit period of the satellite. As I mentioned, the nature papers on this are just coming out now, like last week or the week before. Uh, so here's Tom on this paper for all the hard work that he did. He got to be one of the 40 or 50 authors on this paper. So thank you, Tom, for all the work you put in. Uh, so I guess you've got like 4% of the authorship in the room tonight, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so the, the, this, this paper is online now. Uh, it's undergoing the proof stage. This is the snapshot of the proofs uh, that we just received a couple days ago. Um, so let's talk about the orbit period change. 
This to me was one of the most exciting data sets that came in and it's probably one of the most mundane. Uh, but essentially what we're looking at is the brightness over time. And what we see is one of these mutual events, one of these dips in brightness. It's noisy because there was a lot of ejecta still around, but we clearly see that mutual event. And we see it at a time associated with an orbit period that is very different from the old orbit period. The mutual event would have been over here on the right if the orbit period was not changed. But because we changed that orbit of the satellite, we're seeing the, the mutual event, the eclipse, come early. And that, this was the key measurement because this stands out so clear. There's no, there's, no mass, there's no hiding this. There's no massaging of the data needed to show that the minimum of this event is too early. <laughs> and it's too early by almost half an hour. Um, the thing that's, uh, in addition to being a significant orbit period change, this is only about 28 hours, 29 hours after impact. We were expecting to make these measurements weeks, if not months after impact. So that tells us that the ejecta became optically thin very quickly. We were able to see through the ejecta and actually measure these mutual events. And so this data set came in, processed it, and we went, wow, we need to start collecting light curves now because we can answer the question we thought we were gonna be answering in December, but we can do it at the end of September. And so that was really cool. And it was fortuitous because as Tom mentioned, after early October, Didymos went through a galactic plane crossing, which made collecting light curves much more challenging. And so rushing to get data um, through a variety of facilities uh, allowed us to pin down the orbit period of the post-impact um, dimorphos to 11.36 hours with a period change of almost 33 minutes. I'll say this is at the upper end of the estimates that were provided from the people running models and simulations ahead of the impact. Um, uh, this, this surprised us. It was within the range of models, but definitely at the upper end. And that's consistent with sort of the spectacular amount of ejecta we saw come off the model. This is one of the figures in that paper, in the Nature paper, um, showing a lot of stuff, but it's essentially showing the confirmation of mutual events, both secondary eclipses and primary eclipses. They're noisy, but they're, undeniable that they're there. And thanks to Tom's efforts, the only Northern Hemisphere facility that contributed to the Nature paper was the Lowell 1.1 meter. So that's really cool. All of these are Southern Hemisphere facilities that were well situated to collect the data when the target was up at you know, one air mass. Tom was looking down through the sludge, but getting data that was good enough to feed into the, this paper and contribute meaningfully to, to that, that first result that showed us that the dimorphos orbit period uh, is now 11.372 hours. <clears throat> All right, so I'm coming in on the end here. <laughs> uh, so stick with me just a little bit more here and let's talk about this in the context of planetary defense. So we have a period change of 33 minutes. That's been confirmed and we're continuing to refine that um, with additional observations like the ones that I showed from this week. And so where does that fall in our range of data? We think beta for this type of impact was something like 3.6. So what that means is that roughly 3. Point, if you have 3.6 units of momentum, one of those came from the spacecraft and 2.6 of them came from the ejecta. So the ejecta is actually dominating the period change, or dominating the orbital deflection of the, of the asteroid. And so the ejecta plays a huge role in these sort of deflection, orbit deflection experiments. So what does that imply? So if we have a period change of 33 minutes, a beta of 3.6, that implies a change in velocity of dimorphos around Didymos of about three millimeters a second, which is something like 100 kilometers per year. So we know if we find an asteroid of dimorphos' size and we hit it with a dart impactor, we can deflect it at something like 100 kilometers per year with that type of impact and impart that kind of velocity change. Yeah. Determine that, like, wouldn't also the, how the asteroid was put together make a difference? Like this one happened to be like a very loosely put together one. And do we know all the different kinds of composition and kinds of variation in the way asteroids are put together where we could actually actually um, guess on what what how this impact would be in other different kinds of asteroids, you know what I mean? Or is this a is this a one of a kind? 
Is this a one-off? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so the question, you know, on some level, it's how representative is Didymos of, or Dimorphos of other asteroids, right? How can, how could we extend these results? So one of the reasons Didymos was picked, other than it being an eclipsing binary, is it's also a, a type of asteroid associated with ordinary chondrite meteorites, which are by far the most common meteorite here on Earth. So when you go and look at meteorite collections, something like 80% of meteorites are ordinary chondrite, which tells us the most common type of impactor that hits the Earth is an ordinary chondrite. So at least from a composition, like a mineral composition perspective, Didymos is very representative. We've, we've covered at least, you know, it's the low hanging fruit. You know, there are other types out there, uh, more exotic iron meteorites and things like that that may have very different impact properties. This doesn't inform that much. There's, there's some aspect of that that we can learn about. Um, and part of the thing there that helps is that at the impact speeds we're talking about, the minerals don't matter that much, actually. It's sort of the physical structure. You know, how loosely bound are the rubbles, the, you know, the boulders that make up the, the body. We think that bodies in this size regime are all rubble piles. Uh, that, that comes down to the fact that their collisional lifetime in the solar system is much less than the age of the solar system. So if you're a 100 meter asteroid floating around in space, chances are you're gonna be broken up many times over in your lifetime before you either escape the solar system or hit a planet. So chances are this structure is probably representative of 100 meter class asteroids in the solar system, but this is the only 100 meter class asteroid in the solar system that we've really visited. So we, yep. We'll be able to leverage what we measure in situ here, compare that to what we saw through our telescopes, and then say, okay, let's look at other asteroids. Do we see similar behaviors for other asteroids photometrically, spectroscopically, that might suggest they are also rubble piles? But it's a gap in our knowledge for sure, and it's something we'll want to address. Yeah. There is a follow-on well, follow question, but related question online. I was speculating, Dean Kettleson was saying, could it possibly expose some ices? So we think because these things are um, rubble piles, they've been broken apart, they've reaccumulated, they've been probably broken apart again, reaccumulated, and they've gone through this cycle to get to what they look like today, highly fractured, highly fragmented, which means that any volatile material probably would have been exposed, you know, any ices, anything that would have sublimated away would have been exposed to space at some point during that complicated history. And so it's unlikely that there are buried subsurface ices on bodies this small. Okay, uh, so sorry I'm going long here. This is, I think this is the last slide, so and probably the last point I'll make. Um, so for a 170 meter asteroid and a DART impactor, we could change the orbit of an object like this, one Earth radius, if we have 60 years lead time. And that's, that's almost exactly within expectations for this type of technique and almost exactly what we would expect for asteroids discovered with current surveys. We're most likely gonna find bodies like this decades before they hit and we'll be left with the question of what do we do to deflect an object like that? And we know now that an impactor like DART could make a significant uh, influence on the orbit of an object. Now, of course, this scales sensitively with the size of the asteroid and the number of dart impactors. If you sent two vending machines or something the size of you know, a larger impactor or a higher velocity impactor, that can change, that can enhance the, the deflection. And so you can easily change this number of 60 years down to 30 years or 20 years. Maybe hard to get under 10 years. But that's the sort of range that we're dealing with here is if we have a decade or a few decades warning time, this is absolutely a viable planetary defense technique and we know how to use it now from the uh, spacecraft design to the autonomous navigation to the measured outcome of the, the deflection. So in that sense, this was, this was the number we were looking for and we got it and we're continuing to refine it, but it's, uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, 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 an indication that this experiment was very much a, a success. So I'll just finish here. Um, so uh, there's lots of information online about DART, the project websites up there. We're still collecting more data and analyzing it. Uh, I think this is a, you know, a highly successful demonstration of this particular technique with a fully autonomous spacecraft. 
and we could leverage this technology for impacts uh, that may come in the sort of few decade uh, warning time. And so I'll just finish with one last slide there uh, that, you know, this, this idea of planetary defense is kind of a, a newish concept in the sense that it's being taken somewhat seriously now with actual missions and, and efforts being uh, implemented to see what we can do about something like this. And so I think we're making baby, baby steps in the right direction and I look forward to seeing where uh, where it goes in the future. So uh, thank you all for your attention. I really appreciate you coming out tonight and I'll take any more questions. So given, <clears throat> given that the ejecta actually was larger than the impact itself, when you think that a nuclear bomb would be a bit more effective? Yep, and th that's not the realm of scientists or NASA, that then becomes Department of Defense, and that's kind of out of our hands. And, and there's, that becomes very political and very much more difficult. If we can do something like this, that's something NASA could lead, it's something that we know how to do now. And so this is much easier, and that's why this was the first experiment. This is the first kind no, of I, experiment. I, I realize this is the way to start. But there, there are scenarios where if we found a 100 meter object with one year warning time, the nuclear option is it. Like that's the only one. And there are models that suggest how that might work. But you know, the idea there is you do a nuclear standoff blast. So you don't actually hit the object, but you, you do the blast um, a kilometer off the surface. And it's the uh, heat wave from the nuclear blast that uh, uh, vaporizes the surface and the entire object acts as a jet and pushes it off. Yeah. That works it, in a computer. Yeah, model it. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about the word deflection? Because in this case, we hit the uh, asteroids head on, and um, it, it was slowed down. But as I always thought, the we might have to come at one of these objects from the side in order to alter it. But perhaps slowing it down is just enough to make it miss Earth some number of years later. So, so slowing it down is as good as hitting it from the side. Is is that Am I th seeing that right? Uh, it, it can go either way. It really can, you can speed it up, you can slow it down. It's all about uh, eliminating the coincidence of the Earth and the asteroid in space and time, at the same space and time, right? And so there are different ways of doing that, whether you speed the asteroid up, slow it down, move it out of the plane, below the plane, whatever. There's different ways. And it all comes down to the details of the launch architecture. When can you launch? How long does it take you to get there? What does your encounter relative velocities look like? You know what what your payload is you know, the, the detail the doubles are in the details there um, in this case as i said we had a specific idea in mind that we wanted to hit head on with the satellite coming at us and that very specifically That's right. constrained the impact parameter space but there are all kinds of interesting political implications when thinking about these scenarios in the real world so if you have an asteroid that's like coming in and going to hit spain for example do you deflect out over the Mediterranean where there maybe are no countries or do you deflect out over Portugal into the Atlantic? And what if you don't get out to the Atlantic and now it's gonna hit Portugal instead? And so is Portugal like that? And so there's, there's like geo, there's literally like geopolitical situations here that people, that, that people at the UN level talk about and think about these scenarios. So, you know, do you speed up? Do you slow down? Where do you move the impact point? And what's gonna you know, minimize risk to the most number of people? Thank you, Dr. Mosco. It's really interesting. Uh, thank you, Tom. Great presentation. And Bob, if you want uh, information about how you can participate with citizen science there. And remember Ted's uh, Mountain Hills uh, event coming up next uh, Saturday. Um, thank you again. This is the end of the meeting. Please help us stack chairs, and we'll see you in April. Thanks.